Welcome, 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 welcome. Get in here, get in here, get in here, folks. It's 52 weeks of leadership and we're super excited today. So thanks for registering and showing up today. My name is Dr. Aisha O'Malley. I am a clinical assistant professor within the School of Management um, and I am on the CHLOE team. So Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. And so welcome to our 50 two weeks of leadership with GEICO, sponsored by GEICO. And so we have a really uh, great speaker today. Um, also, before we get into that, I actually wanna also talk about our Chloe conference that's coming up. And I don't know if you haven't heard, if you've not registered, then you're not in the know. So you need to get on and, and, and get registered for Daniel Pink, who is our keynote speaker. We're super excited about um, him. We were able to pick up where we left off. Um, and so um, we didn't have a Chloe conference last year, but this year we're definitely having one. Um, and so the theme here is the future of leadership, changing the way we live and work. That is on June 3rd, 2021, starting at 8 a.m. and goes until 5 p.m. and it's virtual. So um, check out management.buffalo.edu uh, forward slash Chloe 2021. You can get all the details and get yourself registered. Um, and so without um, you know, taking up too much more time, I do want to introduce our great speaker today. We're very excited to introduce Dr. Maureen Mullane. Um, and she is the president of Transformation Consulting Services um, an executive leadership coach for UB Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness and executive MBA programs. Um, her consulting work focuses on strategic planning, board and staff retreats and organizational development. Today, we are gonna hear her talk about leadership with emotional intelligence. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce her and have her come in and start our day. Thank you, Maureen. Hi everybody, thanks Aisha, appreciate your help in introducing the program today. So we're gonna to talk about leading with emotional intelligence. So what are we gonna talk about? What is emotional intelligence and why is it important? I'm gonna share some lessons learned in my experience as a manager, a consultant and a coach. And I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. We'll have the chat box open at the end of the presentation. Aisha will be fielding some questions that you might have. We will end with tools to strengthen your capacity to lead. I appreciate you giving us these 30 minutes. I want to make sure that you walk away with some new tools to, to work with. So what is emotional intelligence? So the picture you're looking at is a workshop that I did pre-COVID. Notice the body language. Notice how engaged people are. In fact, in communication, 55% of how people communicate their feelings is through the body language. So, this was a great uh, opportunity to get people engaged. They're leaning forward, a lot of interest. People are, are listening. Here's, pre, here's COVID times. Here's a workshop I did. Um, I'm one of the screens up on the top. There were some people in the room, some people virtual. Uh, not the best way to communicate, to pick up on what people are thinking and feeling. Emotional intelligence can be hard. And now we're gonna be moving into post COVID where we're back in kind of this world of, of isolation and what's so important now will be how do we use emotional intelligence? So where did it all come from? Originally IQ was the big thing. Um, in 1918, this was during the recruiting for World War I, they used IQ tests to determine who should be allowed to become part of the army. Well, that's fine, but then you move into the 1970s and 1990s and became aware with Daniel Goleman, Howard Gardner, looking at different frames of intelligence, really that are other things besides IQ and EQ is as important and maybe even more so. So what is emotional intelligence? I like to say it's understanding yourself and others to maximize positive, positive outcomes. The difference between a good leader and a great leader can come down to emotional intelligence. So I'm just gonna focus on today. You're all on this call today because you are leaders. So let's see if we can maximize your leadership skills with emotional intelligence. We're gonna look at a grid, but we start with ourselves. What do you notice about yourself? Self-awareness is really critical when you're gonna work with other people. 
because today's world, you don't do anything alone. How you are aware of yourself is one part. What I notice, how I respond, self-management. So self-awareness is great, but how you manage your emotions and awareness is just as important. So some questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about self-awareness. First of all, what time of the day do I do my best work? Understanding yourself is going to make, maximize your, your opportunities to really be effective. What employee or peers or boss um, behaviors get under your skin and how do you react? So think about that. If you get an email or something that is, uh, gets your blood boiling, do you immediately respond to all? Do you wait a little bit? Do you not respond and avoid? So understanding what is, the, what is the different ways you communicate. And do people smile when they see you coming or do they run the opposite way? So again, being aware of how people are reacting to you is really, really important. So the picture you see is Dr. Jay Desai. He is the co-founder and CEO of Patient Pink. He raised $100 million venture capital to start this organization. He believes that it's important to have a user manual. Now we all get cars and we have a user manual. If you're like me, you probably never look at that user manual until you see a red light on blinking on the dashboard and you gotta figure out what it is and then you go find that user manual. But he's saying, if you wanna be effective and you wanna work well with him, then he gives his new employees a user manual. And it talks about everything from how do you communicate? Does he prefer to use text? Does he prefer email? Does he like Slack? So he's giving people the tools, a user manual to understand how to work with them. Does he want and expect immediate response on the weekends? Is he a process person? Are you somebody who likes to think out loud to get people's ideas going? Or do you wanna see final production? You, want, you don't wanna get cut to the chase, tell me what we need to know. Understanding yourself and the people around you can be really effective. Having a user manual can help. So some of you may know this person, President Ronald Reagan. Some of you may not have even been born when President Reagan was around. But his belief was, if you can't summarize an issue on one page, you don't understand the issue well enough. So when he had his cabinet meetings, he expected people to have a one-page synopsis. In some cases at those cabinet meetings, he was making eight major decisions. How did he do it? He wanted it all on one page. He said that was really critical. That was his style. If you wanted to work well with him, you followed his style. So let's talk about self-awareness. You understand who you are, but sometimes self-awareness, you're not aware of what other people think about you. And that's why 360s are so great. 360 is an assessment, which is used to, to interview, talk with other people that are your peers, your supervisor, people that report to you to find out, well, how do they think you do? You might think you're the hot stuff, but when it comes to communication or it comes to working with people or understanding people or having empathy, may not be so good. 360s are a really effective way when coaching to really understand yourself, but also the people around you. And I will say in the years of working with coaching, 360s are such an aha moment for so many people who don't understand why people don't pay attention to them or don't understand why people run the other way when they're coming forward. So 360s, it's, it takes a lot of leadership to say, okay, I'm willing to see what other people have to say about me, but it's a really effective tool when you're coaching. Self-management really has a lot to do with emotions. So how do you respond to that email? We talked about that that makes your blood boil. Really think about that. That's one way people communicate. What kind of mood is the boss in today? How many of you, and I bet if we raise some hands, how many of you, have had someone come up to you and say, hey, what is the boss like today? Is this a good day to talk with him or do I just wanna go away? We've all been through that. Now here's a McKinsey report that was recently done last March and it asked uh, employees, 56% of American workers claim that their boss is mildly or highly toxic, 56%. 75% of Americans say that their boss is the most stressful part of their work day. Doesn't make you feel too good to know that you are the one that's responsible for making people feel stressed out. Or are you the one that has to deal with a boss that stresses you out? 
So again, emotional intelligence can play into understanding what that's all about. But that's, you know, that's kind of sad when you think about it. And all the research shows that why do people leave their organization? For the most part, the majority of them leave because of the boss. So we've all gone through a lot with COVID, but I wanna take you back in time to World War II. And this is a photo of underground where the railroads were in uh, London, England. And you can see these are people sleeping at night in London. Why? Because of the bombs. In fact, the bombs that German Luftwaffe was bombing, they bombed 56 out of 57 days in a row. 56 out of 57 days in a row, bombing coming down. And so they had to hide underneath. The safest place to be was underneath in the tunnels. So who had just become prime minister? Churchill. Churchill is a leader that many of us studied and understand that he really understand the importance of not only self-management, but relationship management, working with people. So I wanna share with you a short video of a woman, she was a secretary that worked underground with Churchill. And this, by the way, is the place where they were working underground in the city of London. Uh, little tiny cramp room where a lot of the war room, where all the decisions were being made is the actual reproduction of that room. And we're gonna listen to this short video of a woman who worked with Churchill. Again, going home, um, mostly we got off on time, but certainly uh, on the 24 hour shift, we, we slept down here in bunks, but we couldn't go to bed obviously till work was finished. I think, I don't think we ever worked right through the night. I think we probably worked quite late, one or two in the morning, and we'd have to be up again at seven. But um, there, there was, provision was made for us to sleep. Very primitive, very hard wooden bunks. Well, we saw him quite a lot, of course, because the corridors were all used by the same people. I just said, good morning, Mr. Churchill, or good morning, Prime Minister. And he'd always stop and speak. Um, not stop for long, perhaps it was just a passing good morning, afternoon. How are you? Sometimes if there'd been a raid, he'd ask um, if we'd been affected or how our family were. But he was always very affable. I think he liked having civilians around him, whether it took the pressure off a bit because he was a man of great emotions, and I think it must have been a tremendous strain with those chiefs of staff who sit, as you probably know, in the cabinet room. He sits in his chair and they sit bang in front of him in here, like a sort of blockade almost. He had a, a room that turned into a kind of amateur cinematograph, and occasionally he'd ask us to join him. He loved watching films. And so one night, some of us thought we would. It was, must have been gone at 12, and so we really would rather have gone to bed. However, we sat in this room and um, waited and waited and, and shuffled about a bit. And then all of a sudden the door burst open and in came Churchill in his pyjamas and dressing gown, a cigar in one hand, a glass of drink in the other. And he just shouted out from the back, when it's here, let it roll. Okay. And I, I can't remember what the film was about. but <laughs> So here you are, the, the prime minister having, having been, been to deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And here's a secretary that remembers, he goes, Winnie's here. He's very, very much engaged with the employees, asked how they were doing, concerned about their raid. What an example of emotional intelligence. So let's look at this grid. We spent some time on personal competence. Now I wanna look at the social competence. What do you notice about social awareness? Are you aware of people around you? And then frankly, how do you respond? What's your relationship management? Living your purpose in day-to-day -day work. 85% of executives and upperclassmen were asked, upper, upper, excuse me, upper management, were asked, is there, is there life? Is there purpose in their life? 85% said yes. What do you think first-line supervisors, first-line managers said? This was a recent survey done, 85%. Take a guess. Only 15%. 15% of those people felt that there was a purpose in life, their day-to-day -day work. That's, that's something that you as a leader needs to work on to make sure that people see the purpose in life. 
So as, as you know, I worked in the hotel industry and I was uh, moved to a new property. They move you around a lot and uh, walked into, uh, as my job was, MBWA, Management by Walking Around, walked into the dishwasher area and saw the dishwashers working. Now the dishwashers, you know, tough work, wet, hot, and the uniforms that this hotel had were one size fits all. So you had some very tall people and the top of their, the jacket, you know, wouldn't really cover them up. And then you had short people and they had to roll up the bottom of their, of their uh, pants. Not really, really great. And so they had the name tags. They couldn't wear name tags because they kept falling off when they're working on the racks. And then I, I looked and thought to myself, you know, what, what is their purpose? Do they understand how important their role is? They, <clears throat> I looked around the, the building and noticed that where they came in, they came in from the back of the building. They never came in through the front doors. They never saw the restaurant for what it was. So what we did is we invited them to come and enjoy the restaurant. Notice the crystal, notice the china, notice what important part of that wonderful experience someone was paying for to enjoy. It had a lot to do with them. So giving them an opportunity to be treated like a guest, to understand their role is really important. We also changed uh, their uniforms. We, we had them made so they fit them. They were one jumpsuit uniform. So it was the right size for them. And then we also had their name embroidered. It was blue uniform, name embroidered in red because it was theirs and there was ownership. And instead of working about, worrying about having dishwashers who lasted maybe one, two, three days, and that was it, we started seeing them last longer. And then we had opportunities for them to be promoted to work in the salad area. So again, finding their purpose, very, very important. Everyone that works for you, everyone has a purpose and it should be involved with your organization. So communication, really some important things to think about. What do the people we work with want or need and how best to deliver it? May not be what you think. So I worked in another hotel uh, where it was uh, primarily uh, different languages, uh, different people speaking. So direct, I was director of HR, human resources. And I said, let's make all the signage in all the different languages representing the different people. We did that. We did that. We thought that was great. Come to find out what? A lot of these people, not only could read, they could not read their language, they could only speak their language. So think a little bit about what it is that you're trying to accomplish and do you really know the people that you're trying to help? Task versus relationship. Last week, Dr. Kate B talked a little bit about negotiating. This is really important skill to be aware of. And although this is a generality, but in general, in the US, Germany, UK, Netherlands, task. If you're gonna get the work done, boom, let's get to business. Let's not talk about anything other than what do we need to accomplish today? Boom, boom, boom. In other countries, India, Italy, and China, it's more relationship building. So I want to know who you are. I wanna to get to understand you before I'm going to do business with you. Task versus relationship, understanding the difference. So in the United States, we have some people that are very task focused. That's what you, in the disc world is sometimes called the, the high Ds. Uh, and then some people are more relationship focused that are more kind of the S's. Understanding your people and understanding what their needs are is important. So if someone is kind of a relationship person, you may wanna ask about what did they do this weekend? What do you think about those bills? If they're a D person, boom, you wanna say, okay, let's look at the agenda, get going. Understanding emotional intelligence, really important here. So another example in a hotel, uh, uh, business professionals walking down the hallway and here is a room attendant, the maid who's gonna clean the rooms. What would you expect the room attendant to do? She's trying to get back the get between the space. Normally, what we would in America would say, okay, just say excuse me, and you walk through. So I'm on the floors, and I'm noticing this Vietnamese uh, room attendant, and she just barrels right through them, doesn't say anything. It's like, wait, th that's very, very rude. What I learned was that in her country, and in many Asian countries it is rude to actually interrupt and say, excuse me, because they're in the middle of conversation and you're interrupting them. What she was doing, and it was very, very subtle, is she would just walk and she'd bow her head and continue on. That was her way of saying, excuse me, understand the people you work with. Social cultural awareness, really important. So relationship management, some things to think about. 
What is your role as a manager? It's really to develop others. Look at your retention rate. Is it because people are being promoted and moving on or they're leaving for other reasons? Managing conflict. Can't have work without conflict. Some conflict can be good. Are you a manager that runs away when there's conflict or are you a manager that gets in the thick of things? Again, different assessments can help you look at your conflict style depending on the situation, depends on the type of conflict management you should use. Encourage collaboration. Today, more than ever in our COVID world, collaboration is key. Back in the office, post COVID, you really got to start thinking about what's important to your employees. This is why emotional intelligence is so important and your customers too. The way you do anything is really the way you do everything. So one last look at the grid. We've looked at the personal competence, what I notice, self-awareness, how I respond, self-management. Social competence is the other critical piece. Are you aware of the people around you, your customers, your employees? And are you understanding how to manage those relationships? Really incredible. I want you to think about these four grids, figure out which, which area you could really focus on to be a better leader. So start today, become a better you to be a better leader. Read, read, read. I can't tell you how much you can learn by reading something you never would consider reading. Try something different, oh, expand your mind. 360s, great as an assessment, DISC, MBTI, Thomas Kilman, wonderful assessments can really help you better understand yourself so you can re re relate to people. Create a leadership development plan, just pick two or three at the most. What are some areas you can work on? Situation analysis versus task versus people. Great opportunity to really take a moment and think, okay, I'm going into a meeting. Who are the people? What do they want? What do they need? And how can I best accomplish that? Again, what is emotional intelligence? Understanding yourself and others to maximize positive outcomes. Add a trusted person. This is a great one to observe you to run a meeting or giving a presentation and provide you some feedback. And I have my partners in crime that have been really helpful for me. Thank you, both Jim and Chris. Some links that I, you might wanna take a look at. Uh, this one is the user manual that I referred to earlier. I've got some great ideas on that. And then learn about another culture. And here's some information about understanding the different um, cut to the chase as far as different cultures. Listen, listen, listen. My last quick story is working with the president of an organization and he couldn't understand why people were not willing to give him ideas and they really just didn't do anything other than just answer him whatever he said he had to be done. And I went and watched, watched him in meetings. He's the first person to talk. I said to him, just do me a favor, next meeting, open the floor up, don't talk. What a difference. It took a couple of meetings for people to trust that. Well, what a difference. And he couldn't believe the difference. It was just a matter of listening to his employees. So I'm going to ask you to commit in writing because as you all know, whether you're starting a new diet or trying to not smoke, committing something in writing is the way to make a difference. So email me today. What are you going to do to work on, on your emotional intelligence? Love to hear your thoughts and thank you so much for your time today. Great, thank you so much, Maureen. That was awesome. I'm so excited to hear that. So we, I'm gonna look in the chat to see if we can get any questions. Um, let's see, oh, we have a question from Rick. Of those who are least self-aware as determined by 360, for example, are there certain attribute weaknesses that are most common? In other words, what are they not aware of? Hmm. I, I think one, most people when they're in a leadership role believe that they are, they've got all the answers. And what becomes very clear is sometimes they don't have all the answers. So hearing from other people that, you know, there may be better ways to do something or they may be open to those ideas. You know, there's not one, or, one right or wrong way that I see but I think this aha moment that I can't believe people think this about me. It's such a shock. So once they get through the shock, then it's okay, well, what are we gonna do about it? So that self-awareness is one part, 
but now what are you going to do about it? And really being willing to work on making yourself better is a, really a sign of a good leader. Great, 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 great information. Um, let's see. Uh, Sujata says, great presentation, Maureen. As leaders, how do we help middle managers develop these skills? Well, I think it's important. Thanks, Sujata. Nice to see you and congratulations on your Athena Award. Uh, I think part of understanding middle management is having the opportunity to make sure you delegate. And for a lot of leaders, uh, I think the hardest thing I find leaders is to delegate, to give your middle management an opportunity to try something, try something, make it happen. If it doesn't happen, okay, so it's a lesson learned. But giving them an opportunity to run a meeting, giving an opportunity to run a project, giving them a chance to grow, that is really your job as a leader to help with your middle management. And if you're a middle manager, ask for it. Say, I'm ready to take on this project. Give me an opportunity, or I'd like to lead the next meeting. Give me an opportunity. So don't sit back. Middle manager, ask for it. If you're a top leader, delegate. Sounds good. Um, we have another question in the chat. How do we get the organizations emotionally intelligent culturally? Mm. What I find is, is if you can get everybody to work together, understanding what culture is, and that's really about behaviors, right? How decisions are made, values. And really sometimes that's a great opportunity to have a retreat or a way for people to get together offline, in person, but really talk about why, why do we exist? What is our purpose? We mm. talked a lot about living your purpose. What is our purpose and how are we making a difference in our internal community and to the world outside? Everybody needs to have a purpose. Sometimes you need to walk people away from their day to day to think about that. The other piece is if you do assessments with a group of senior leaders, having them understand the different people's leadership style, how do they communicate? What's their decision making? Those are really great opportunities to learn that there's not just one right or wrong way. And if I now know better how you like to be listened to or you like to make a decision, I'm gonna be more effective as your peer and as your boss and as your employee. Okay, great answer. Um, I love how you bring it back to purpose, uh, Maureen. Uh, I think sometimes we forget about that, right? And we get caught up into the minutia of the daily running of the business, but purpose is so important, especially for your employees. So great answer. We have another question. How to really understand the person and how they think of themselves, given that what they show you might not be might not be different from who they really are. Okay, okay. Say that one again. Oh, I let me see. Understand that one. Uh, from Sam, uh, how to really understand the person and how they think of themselves, given that what they show you may not be different from who they really are. Um, so, so I, if I understand the question, I, I think sometimes it's a matter of having some one-on-ones. So whether that's pulling somebody away and having a cup of coffee and just saying, hey, you know, really haven't had a chance to get to know you on a, on a more deeper level. You know, what makes you tick? What are you interested in? Starting to get to know who that person is and understand, you know, do they have a family? Do they have, you know, COVID issues, especially now that we're coming back together again, really understanding people and the lives they're living and why some people may be resistant to coming back, where other people are willing, willing want to come back, and what their lives is, uh, lives are. I think those are really important things. So that kind of taking the time, everyone appreciates taking taking the time to get to know someone, and it can be no more than a ten minute coffee break. Just start start the conversation. Great, great way to end this uh, 30 minute, uh, 52 weeks of leadership, Maureen. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for informing us on emotional intelligence and how we can develop that within ourselves and within the organization. And so I wanna thank all of our participants. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll see you next Monday. Uh, our next speaker is Anthony Baloney, and he'll be talking on creativity more than thinking outside the box. So thanks again, guys. We appreciate you and see you on Monday. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody.
Great.